Good evening. My name is Roxanne Chabot from RBC Consultants. Welcome to our Skin Chat webinar. This evening, we're going to be talking about the relevance of skin barrier maintenance during acne treatment, optimizing patient outcomes with ceramide containing adjunctive skin care. Our speakers this evening are Dr. Lauren Schachner, who is a professor and chair emeritus, Dr. Philip Frost, Department of Dermatology and Cutaneous Surgery, Professor, Department of Pediatrics at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. We also have Dr. Heather Willery Loy. Dr. Willery Lloyd is Director of Skin of Color Division, Dr. Philip Frost, Department of Dermatology and Cutaneous Surgery, also at University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. We'd like to thank our supporter, CeraVe, for making this educational event possible. Before we begin, a couple of logistic tips. If you're having issues hearing the webinar, you can listen to the presentation using your telephone. Just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will appear. If you're having technical issues or if you would like to submit a question to our faculty, please submit to your questions using the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of this webinar, a survey will be emailed to you within one to two days. We'd greatly appreciate it if you could fill it in and send it back to us. Also within one to two days of the webinar, a certificate of attendance and the recording of this webinar will be emailed to you. Again, if you wanna submit questions, use the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen. And I wrote a little note there so you could see where you needed to type it in. So without further ado, I am going to pass the floor virtually to Dr. Lauren Schachner. Good evening. So happy to be with uh, my colleagues discussing this important subject, often an undeveloped subject, and that is the importance of barrier function in uh, acne treatment and in maintenance of benefit of treatment for our acne patients. I'm delighted to be on a faculty one of my favorite former residents, chief residents, and now colleagues, Dr. Heather Willery Lloyd. We're going to start with a question. Acne treatments that can compromise the epidermal barrier include benzoyl peroxide, topical retinoids, systemic retinoids, none of the above or all of the above. Take a few seconds and make a selection. Well, the vast majority of you went for all of the above, and that's good because we're kind of starting then in the same place where we understand that the ep epidermal barrier is both potentially part of the problem and part of the solution in the treatment of our acne patients. Our objectives tonight are to look at the relation between acne and the skin barrier function, look at nuances in prevention, treatment, and maintenance of acne therapy and the impact on the barrier, and explore the role of the best moisturizers and cleansers and the key ingredients that give them a exemplary role for our patients in adjunctive therapy. But this is a subject that we've recently published on. Dr. Lloyd and I joined a panel of really great experts like Dr. Alexis and Pearson and Gold, Kirai and Kirchick, among others, as we talked about what our insights into acne and the skin barrier were and how to optimize treatment regimens with ceramide containing skincare. You can see that our conclusion was that epidermal barrier dysfunction contributes to acne exacerbation. Using appropriate treatment in skincare in the way of moisturizers and cleansers help to minimize irritation and inflammation and enhance treatment adherence and improve patient outcomes. We realize that if we give benzoyl peroxide, a topical trend line, full strength straight on, we're going to have problems with patient adherence, and in all circumstances, our patients can do better with the appropriate choice of skincare and moisturization and in cleansers. 
This paper was published just uh, two months ago in Journal of Cosmetic Dermatology. We speak about acne because it's the most common skin disease in the United States. Affecting up to 50 million Americans annually begins really before puberty because you can't have neonatal and infantile and prepubertal acne, but most of the patients we see are in the 12 to 24 range. But of late, I'm sure many of you have noticed that we see patients in their 30s and 40s and beyond. 10 years ago, a study said the annual cost, the treatment and lost productivity among those who sought medical care for acne exceeded 1.2 billion. I'm sure it exceeds that by a lot now. The lost productivity alone for patients and caregivers due to acne was over 400 million, and over 5 million people in each year seek care for their acne. Acne is more, as we've been taught, than skin deep. It has very significant social, psychological, and physical consequences. It can be associated with lower self-esteem, anxiety, and profound depression. It may produce negative emotions in an individual, embarrassment, humiliation, self-consciousness, but it goes beyond those because there are true financial, social, economic impacts because the perception of others when they see somebody with severe or nodular acne will often lead to loss of employment opportunities. And in fact, people with acne, severe grade, have increased unemployment rates. I've always told my acne patients that I saw our role working together as patient and physician is one, to avoid acne scars in their skin, but two, to avoid psychological scarring from acne. We've often been taught through the years that this complex multifactorial disease is in fact of four elements, too much sebum production, follicular hyperkeratinization with a sticky follicular canal, the role of C. acnes producing lipases and free fatty acids and inflammation. But I submit to you that the fifth element really should be barrier dysfunction. So while we focus on four main factors, androgen mediated sebogenesis, hyperkeratinization, colonization with cuticarium acnes, took me a while to get over the change from propion bacteria acnes, and inflammation that induces both innate and adaptive immune mechanisms, we'll tonight talk about a fifth element, and that is the barrier. So statement number one from our group, and Dr. Woolery Lloyd and I will go over five statements with you, is that acne is associated with epidermal barrier dysfunction. We see increased water loss, we see decreased ceramides, and that goes along with our typical findings of comedogenesis, inflammatory papules and pustules, and results of follicular rupture. Recent advances in acne etiology have taken place in all these elements. Immunological factors and bacterial aspects play an important role. In early acne, the lesions, even before we can visualize the comedone, we often see CD4 lymphocytic infiltrates around the follicle where the comedone will begin. Once comedone formation is at hand, we see CD3 adding to the CD4 effect with macrophages and cells along with the activation of sticky inducing molecules like vascular adhesion selectin molecules. C acnes will join the fray in the interfollicular ducts. Sebaceous glands will, with the C. acne, stimulate Langerhans cells and keratinites and sebocytes via toll-like receptor 2, resulting in a production of a cascade of interleukins, interferons, and tumor necrosis factors. And we have innate and adaptive immunity with inflammatory lesions such as papules, pustules, and nodules, and cysts. And eventually we have acne lesions with healing with interleukins 1B, 1723, and tumor necrosis factor present. There's been recent advances in the study of hyperkeratinization. We know that hyperkeratinization occurs in the infundibulum, leading to sticky laminated corneocytes, 
and increased numbers and size of keratohyaline granules. Keratin 16 and 17, with both promote hyperproliferation of the cells, are expressed in acne lesions. We see that something's wrong in the follicle because in acne lesions, everything's turned to telogen and catagen, and that is part of the switch we see when K79, keratin 79, and 75, which both modulate normal production of keratinocytes in a canal, in a follicular canal, and normal regeneration are both decreased, while the bad guys, A16 and 17, are increased within the acne lesion. Advances in sebum, the sebogenesis based disease features C acne, which will produce lipase, convert sebum to free fatty acids. And in fact, in patients with acne, FFAs are up over 50%. Free fatty acids induce not like receptors in flamisones, this one in particular three, which will drive inflammation and can drive fibrosis as well. IGF-1 is up, and we find that sebum excretion rate will predict what type of acne severity we're going to see. The greater the excretion rate, the higher the severity. Another good guy who gets knocked out in acne lesions is linoleic acid, which promotes moisturization and anti-inflammatory activity. It's much reduced in acne patients. And one of the overlooked villains, which could be a target, would be lipid peroxidase. Some have said that it's the match that sets off the whole fire of acne, influencing both hyperkeratosis and inflammation. So this disorder with C acne as a driver of fatty acids, we'll see the presentation of both comedones and also inflammatory lesions with activity of both adaptive and innate immunity. C acnes, renamed from what I learned many years ago as a resident in early in dermatology, once called P acnes, but because of its biochemical and genomic investigation, became cutibacteria acne, and it's believed to be a very major player in acne pathogenesis. One of the things that is very significant is that there are multiple C. acnes phylotypes in normal skin, but in acne, that diversity is lost, and there is a proliferation of IA1 C. acne phylotype, which overwhelms the other phylotypes in acne pathogenesis. At the same time, we see dysbiosis in the skin microbiome with a balance between Staph epi and C. acne is out of whack, and C. acne predominates in acne development. Statement number two, studies have found an impaired water barrier function, higher trans-epidermal water loss. And this is something we see in so many conditions where ceramides are decreased, not only acne, but it's a major feature of atopic dermatitis seen in psoriasis, perhaps a discussion for another night, but trans-epidermal water loss certainly uh, is much higher around acne in inflammatory lesions and even earlier on, because it's associated with ab inherent abnormalities in the barrier and transepidermal water loss, always a marker for when I'm gonna see decreased ceramizing condition. The follicular epithelial barrier is directly involved with changes that occur during comedogenesis and in stages of inflammation, especially with rupture. But beyond the disease itself, some of the important therapies, as many of you pointed out at the beginning of the quiz, can induce alterations in the epidermis that can lead to changes that disrupt other normal physiological functions included in the stratum corneum. And we think of the redness and scaling associated with benzoyl peroxide or tretinoids or 13 cis retinoic acid. We see within the barrier in acne that there is a decrease in linoleic acid and also in free sphingosin and total ceramides. And we see this decrease in ceramides so often running in parallel with increased 
the transepidermal water loss. Another factor is maintaining a normal skin pH in the four to six range. Consensus panels of experts in atopic dermatitis and in acne agree that cleanses and moisturizers close to this physiological skin surface pH of four to six will support the skin barrier repair, decrease inflammation, increase antimicrobial defenses. pH is in the sweet zone when we're dealing in four to six. And when we think about cleanses, there are many excellent cleansers that deliver a pH of four to six, but soaps by definition are alkaline and will be bringing in a pH of over seven, further complicating the barrier function. So pH is essential in stratum cordium integrity and in the appropriate rate of desquamation. It is imperative for appropriate lipid lamellosynthesis with the production of cerebides, the cholesterol, and appropriate free fatty acids, and exceedingly important in antimicrobial activity. The higher the pH over the range of our four to six, the more likely to have dysbiosis and a displacement of our commensural microbiome. So elevated skin pH may delay barrier recovery and facilitate the barrier breakdown with decrease in lamella body secretions of vital lipids like ceramides that provide for a permeability bat barrier. The structural and functional integrity of the stratum corneum highly dependent on adequate water and pH, and this goes hand in hand with appropriate intracellular and quantified lipid envelope. Lamella bodies produce lipid phase, a mixture of ceramides, cholesterol, and free fatty acids that are the border to the bricks of the keratinocytes. And if it's out of balance, then the function of the barrier is going to be impaired. Let's take a look at that. This is differences in stratum corneum ceramide levels, the leading lipid in the barrier, comparing acne affected skin and no acne. On top, without acne, and you see the very severe decrease in ceramide concentration in moderate acne. At the same time, if we look at transepidermal water loss, without acne, it's almost doubled when we have even moderate acne. So this two-prong, decreased ceramide, increased transepidermal water loss, exceedingly important. The impaired water barrier function caused by decreased amounts of ceramides may be responsible for comedial formation since barrier dysfunction is accompanied by hyperkeratosis of the follicular epithelium. Sebum production is higher, and the size of sebaceous gland larger than people with acne prone facial skin compared with normal subjects, and inherent structural or functional epidermal barrier disorders in acne need to be addressed therapeutically, especially as certain acne medicines, as mentioned, can alter some of the epidermal properties. In conclusion, acne is associated with skin barrier dysfunction. We've talked about ceramides being decreased, water loss being increased, among other issues, and it leads to water binding capacity being decreased. And this, of course, can lead to comedo exacerbation and exacerbation of the acne. Treatment with benzoyl peroxides, retinoids can exacerbate this dysfunction, leading to dry skin and irritation. And this can contribute to poor adherence. Many studies have shown that dryness, redness, and scaling from our acne treatments are one of the leading causes of our patients not adhering to the good therapies you give them and I give them. This can be greatly attenuated and prevented with the appropriate use of excellent moisturizers and cleansers. And on that note, I get to turn this over to my excellent colleague, Dr. Heather 
Willa Reloy. Thank you. Thank you for such a great summary on you know the role of the skin barrier in acne. And I'm going to kind of keep going with that. And first, though, I'm going to start with a polling question. So let's see our polling question. And this is a very simple question. So when do you recommend moisturizer application in your acne patients? Is it before the retinoid, after the retinoid, or it doesn't matter? And I'll tell you what I do once we see what all of you guys do. But I think this is an interesting question. There's no right or wrong answer. It's just to get a feel for what we're all doing in our practices when we're recommending moisturizers for our acne patients. So I'm curious to see what you all think and what you all do in your practice. Okay, so it's split pretty evenly. This is very interesting to me. So 48% of you apply before, 45% after the retinoid, and some, an 8% said it doesn't matter. The 8% are probably right, because that's what the studies suggest. I personally recommend it after the retinoid. Um, just because I'm a creature of habit, that's how I've always done it. But studies have shown that it really doesn't matter. It uh, doesn't change the efficacy of our retinoid, and they've looked specifically at this. So this is an interesting finding. I didn't know what we were going to see. So now let's move on and talk about the next statements that we had in this consensus paper. So statement three talks a little bit about products and it states that common ingredients in acne products like benzoyl peroxide and retinoids can irritate the skin. And statement four talks a little bit about, more about that epidermis and that barrier disruption. And statement four states that some acne therapies can induce epidermal alterations that disrupt the physiologic functions of the epidermis leading to dryness and erythema. And that is gonna be a theme that you're gonna hear throughout this evening because there is a real issue with dryness and erythema in our acne. So let's talk a little bit about the cycle of skin barrier disruption in our acne patients. So you can see right here, skin with acne at baseline, we've heard from Dr. Schachner, is deficient in ceramides. And they have a, this skin has a reduced barrier function. It can cause dysbiosis and activate our innate immunity. And then our patients are using harsh cleansers that they buy over the counter to remove sebum because a lot of our patients feel that they can scrub their acne away. And so they can get very aggressive with their cleansers. And not only are they removing their oil and their makeup, but they're removing the natural lipids in the skin. And then we as dermatologists, add leave-on acne treatments. And these often have harsh actives. So we have you know, retinoids and benzoyl peroxide, which can be drying in and of themselves. And then they also, things like topical antibiotics have alcohol, they're typically alcohol-based, which can further disrupt that barrier. And then what you see is this weakened skin barrier where the skin becomes dehydrated, flaky, and it feels tight. And this is a common complaint in acne patients who are not being, when we don't address the skin barrier. So when we think about our acne treatments, we think of um, it addressing multiple factors that influence acne. So inflammation and um, bacteria are the first, are two that kind of are very closely intertwined. We think about influencing hyperkeratinization and we think about influencing comedogenesis. So we're gonna start with that inflammation and bacteria. So the main states of treatment for inflammatory acne are benzoyl peroxides, retinoids, and antimicrobials. And these really work on inflammation. So benzoyl peroxide, obviously it's bactericidal, it kills bacteria via many mechanisms, the cell wall, the DNA gyrase in the bacteria, but it also is comedolytic. We sometimes don't think of as benzoyl peroxide as comedolytic. It does have some comedolytic effect. And it has been shown to inhibit the production of C. acne's biofilms. And this, I think, can be very important for inflammation because the bacteria and acne tends to go very closely with inflammation. Um, also, antibiotics are not only kill bacteria, but also are anti-inflammatory and can inhibit cytokines like IL-6 and IL-8. So that's addressing the inflammation and the bacterial component of acne. Now, when we talk about hyperkeratinization, retinoids are the big drivers. Those are, the, those are like our hero product that regulate an abnormal keratinization in the infundibulum of acne lesions. So all retinoids work on hyperkeratinization. Topical triferritine is a novel retinoid that targets the RER gamma receptor, and it's indicated for truncal acne, um, 
And then, as I mentioned, benzoyl peroxide has this keratolytic, this comedolytic effect. So even though we think of benzoyl peroxide as being anti-inflammatory and killing bacteria, it is also a little bit comedolytic. And of course, uh, oral isotretinoin can inhibit hyperkeratosis in the infant dibulum, and it also blocks toll-like receptors, which drive inflammation. And then when we think about sebogenesis, so the production of oil, we have some newer agents on the market. So clascoterone can reduce sebum production. It's, it's FDA approved for patients in, with acne ages nine years of age and older. Of course, oral isotretinoin is probably the biggest and strongest inhibitor of sebum production. You see not only a reduction in sebum, but an inhibition in the size of the sebaceous glands. And acne patients who are on isotretinoin get really dried out, which is great. It has like pluses and minuses. So their face really clears up, face, chest, and back, which is what we're focusing on for the acne. But they also can get severely dry skin on the body. Dry lips is the biggest side effect that I would see in my practice. And even with, with high doses of isotretinoin, they can get almost an eczema type rash because their skin is so dry. Topical linoleic acid we heard about earlier, and it's been shown to have some efficacy in acne, but there's no significant reduction in sebum. Topical antiandrogens are very effective. They can help um, with sebum production, as I mentioned. IGF-1 is one that I think is very interesting because insulin-like growth factor drives the growth of those. It, it kind of activates our sebocytes. So this is, I think, a novel and interesting approach that we might see in the future in acne. And then, of course, systemic antiandrogens, think antiandrogens, things like spironolactone, can also be helpful with sebum and effective against acne. So now let's talk about future treatments. So when I think about the future treatments for acne, we're really focusing more on this inflammation that we see in acne. So in the past, you know, we focused on other things, but I think inflammation is a hot topic when it comes to acne. And a lot of the newer treatments are going to address inflammation. Now, the other thing that I think is interesting that is some of our newer treatments for acne are going to address the acne scar. And as someone who does treats a lot of patients with skin of color, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation is a big part of my practice and it's a big part of treating acne. And so I use a lot of cosmeceuticals, things like vitamin C, azelaic acid, tranexamic acid, lots of different topical things that really help with the hyperpigmentation that we see from acne. But what I think it's even more interesting is that there are some new studies that are looking at retinoids to treat atrophic scars. So we know that retinoids work great for acne in general, but there are some new studies looking specifically at retinoids and their effects on atrophic scars. So I think this is a very exciting time when it comes to new treatments for acne. These are new indications for our existing treatments like retinoids. The more complicated and challenging things to treat are things like hypertrophic scars and keloids. Those are the ones that I think there's a lot of room for more research because those by far are the most challenging things to treat. Those um, large hypertrophic scars after acne are really a challenge. And right now in my practice, I treat them with intralesional trimcinolone. So let's talk, we've been talking about, you know, all of these different treatments and basically almost all of our treatments for acne cause dryness and irritation. So at the top of the list, retinoids, we all know that and we talk about this with our patients, can cause irritation and dry skin. Antibiotics, oral not as much, but definitely topical antibiotics because most topical antibiotics come in an alcohol-based solution. So then we do see dryness and irritation from the vehicle. Now, the interesting thing, the only thing on this list that does not tend to cause dryness or irritation is topical dapsone. And I actually do use this a lot in my practice, especially in adult female patients, because they tend to be a little bit more dry, a little bit more likely to be irritated. And this is a very well-tolerated acne treatment with rates of dryness of less than 5%, which is atypical for most acne treatments. Now, the androgen receptor inhibitor, clascoterone, is pretty well tolerated, it can occasionally cause dryness. And then of course, all of our combination products, so things that have benzoyl peroxide and antibiotics and retinoids, any of those three mixed together commonly causes irritation and dryness because there tends to be an additive effect. So now let's talk a little bit about acne treatment and skin barrier function. So we've established clearly that our acne therapies can disrupt the stratum corneum. Specifically, we see increased transepidermal water loss with topical benzoyl peroxide, tretinoin, tazeratine, isotretinoin. So our treatments really need to 
combine skincare products that have lipids and ceramides that help to manage this barrier disruption that we commonly see with our acne prescription therapy. So we're gonna talk a little bit about skincare and the role of skincare in acne. So you can see here, we talked about pH uh, briefly, and I'm just gonna dive a little bit deeper into pH and the effect of pH on our skin. So basically we all know our skin has a natural acidic pH. The skin's pH is between four and six. And we know that traditional soaps have an alkaline pH by definition, as Dr. Schachner said, of between 10 and 12. But even water has a slightly alkaline pH. So you might not realize this, but when you wash your face with water, it actually is disrupting the pH of your skin. It does return back to normal, but even water can be slightly alkaline. So our goal when we're treating um, our patients and we're choosing skincare for our patients with acne is that we wanna choose things that have a slightly acidic pH because those are less likely to cause irritation. So our cleansers and moisturizers that are as close as possible to our physiological skin pH of between four and six can reduce skin irritation and improve skin barrier function. And of course, we really wanna stay away from any products that are alkaline because those are highly irritating to our skin. So this brings us to statement five. And statement five states that ceramide containing cleansers and moisturizers used as an adjunct to acne treatment have improved the barrier function and reduced irritation. So let's talk a little bit about that. So when we think about cleansers, we know that cleansers have surfactants and they basically remove oil and makeup and debris, but they can also, these surfactants in these cleansers disrupt our stratum corneum. So they can cause erythema and dryness, skin barrier impairment, and of course, increase that pH, which is a big problem. Studies do suggest that even just the simple addition of a gentle facial skin cleanser and moisturizer in patients with mild acne and dry skin, so my typical adult female patient, she might have mild to moderate acne and dry skin, Studies suggest that that simple gentle facial cleanser and moisturizer can reduce acne and improve dry skin and increase levels of endogenous ceramides in the stratum corneum. So this is really interesting because we know that you, you use a moisturizer, it's going to moisturize the skin, but there are actually studies that show that using a moisturizer with ceramides can actually increase your endogenous ceramides in your skin. So when we are treating our patients with acne, it's very important to use a mild facial gentle cleanser. And another study showed that twice daily use of a gentle cleanser in patients with mild to moderate acne, reduced acne lesion counts without damage to the skin barrier or sebum overcompensation. That's a really important point because a lot of our patients think, oh, I don't wanna use something gentle, I need to use something harsh because otherwise I'm going to produce more oil. Multiple studies have showed this with lots of reproducibility that gentle cleansers and moisturizers do not increase the perception of oily skin. So that's an important thing to mention to your patients if you get any pushback that they don't wanna use a gentle cleanser and a moisturizer. A lot of our acne patients are resistant to using moisturizers. Now, when you're looking at skincare for your acne patients, there are some general things that we are we're gonna talk about on this table. And this table is from the consensus paper that was recently published. So the first bullet talks about just a general statement, daily use of ongoing fragrance-free, non-irritating and non-comedogenic cleansers, moisturizers and sunscreen are important in our acne patients. Now, this is the first time I've mentioned sunscreen and sunscreen is really important for me. I treat a lot of skin of color patients and post-inflammatory pigment is a big problem. And sunscreen prevents that post-inflammatory pigment, just the addition of sunscreen, even if you don't use cosmeceuticals. So I always recommend sunscreen for my patients. Now, the next bullet talks about monotherapy with retinoids, which we typically use for mild, mild acne, which is anti-inflammatory and it reduces flares, helps with oil control, and retinoids, as we're learning, may minimize scars. But even with mild retinoid therapy, monotherapy, ceramide-containing uh, skincare can be very helpful because even though their acne is mild, the barrier is still disrupted. Now, in our more severe patients, moderate to severe patients, where we're using other things, we're using retinoids, we might be using a topical benzoyl peroxide, we might also be using a topical clindamycin, we might be using a salicylic acid cleanser. Those really can influence the barrier. And I think that although skincare is important for all of our acne patients, we have to really spend time with our moderate to severe patients because they really benefit from a very robust skincare routine that helps to manage our barrier. 
And then the last bullet talks about maintenance. So a lot of patients think when their acne clears up, they're done. They can stop their prescriptions. But we all know that for the vast majority of patients, you can't stop your prescription when you've, you, even though your acne clears. So I emphasize to my patients that it doesn't work if you're not using it, so you have to keep using it. And the same goes for skincare. We still need ceramide containing moisturizers and gentle cleansers even when they clear up, you know, we want them to keep using that to maintain that barrier and very healthy skin. So when we think about moisturizers, what does that ideal moisturizer look like? So it should be safe, effective, and cost-effective. Cost is very important to me because acne patients get multiple prescriptions with a lot of co-pays. So we really, I think affordable skincare can be very important for that acne patient. We want it to be free of additives, fragrance, and sensitizing agents. We want it to be pleasant to use, optimize lipid and water content in the stratum corneum. And most importantly, we want our patients to be satisfied. They want have to want to put that moisturizer on every day. That's really as important as all of the other things on this slide. And there was a paper that looked at moisturizers as an adjunct in acne treatment. And in this paper, they used the Delphi process. It was a systematic literature review where they looked at acne treatment, dry skin, irritation, depletion of ceramides and acne. And then the panel reached a consensus with statements on how moisturizers can be used as an adjunct in acne. And the consensus statements, not surprisingly, the first one, dry skin and irritation is an important reason for non-adherence. So a lot of our patients will stop using our prescriptions because they get dry and irritated. The second one, second statement is that skin barrier dysfunction can contribute to acne. Dry skin and irritation commonly result from our prescription therapies and systemic retinoids. And moisturizers can improve the dryness and irritation from acne treatment, and they may enha enhance adherence. I think they definitely en enhance adherence um, and complement acne treatment. And moisturizers and cleansers should be considered in our acne-treated patients. So I think that this is something that I use in my practice all the time because I really emphasize skincare. So when it comes to cleansers and moisturizers, they're very important to support that epidermal barrier because as we mentioned, if you're using products, cleansers and or just any skincare that has an, that elevates the skin's pH, you're gonna see reduction in the epidermal barrier integrity, reduction in the antimicrobial defenses and increased inflammation. And if you use cleansers and moisturizers with ceramides and or essential fatty acids, you see a restoration of that epidermal barrier function, you see reduced transepidermal water loss, maintenance of that skin, that acidic pH that we know is what is a healthy pH for our skin, and we see improved antimicrobial defenses. So when you look at papers that have looked at skincare for patients with acne, there, there's a very strong consensus, and you'll see kind of rep repeating themes here. So the first paper by Feldman shows that patients scored common reasons for low adherence, and they looked at why did patients not adhere to their to their skincare regimen that we or the prescriptions that we wrote, and the main one was medication side effects like dry skin and skin irritation. The next study showed that factors that improve adherence, right? So we know that dry skin and irritation cause low adherence, but it improves adherence using moisturizers and cleansers. Um, so that's gentle cleansers. That's really important to improve adherence. Being clinically effective, so seeing results, and then patient knowledge of treatment. I spend a lot of time educating my patients. I probably spend too much time because I end up running behind, but I think it's really important for patients to have realistic expectations and patient knowledge of treatment is important. So you have to spend time with your patients explaining what to expect. The next study looked at skin irritation and dryness and also showed that it led to poor treatment adherence. Another study showed that more simple and combined regimens provided better outcomes. This is key. Most of my patients get three steps in the morning, three steps at night. Some might get four steps if I'm treating post-inflammatory pigment, but I really try to keep my skincare routines very simple when I'm treating acne because when it gets too complicated, people can't adhere to those um, this, the, our prescription regimens. And the last bullet, the last study talks about the use of a gentle cleanser and moisturizers being beneficial in improving the epidermal barrier function. So you've seen multiple studies over and over showing that maintaining a healthy epidermis is, is, is very important with the use of cleansers, gentle cleansers and moisturizers. So for improved adherence to treatment, we want to 
um, address factors that cause poor adherence. So we want to avoid incomplete or slow response to therapy. That's something that can happen. And we can't speed up therapy. We can't set unrealistic expectations, but we want people to know how long it takes for their acne to get better. If they have adverse events like skin irritation or dryness, that's gonna to lead to poor adherence and skincare routines that are too complicated. As I mentioned, if they're too complicated or they're inconvenient, they're not going to follow through and get the results that we all want them to get. Now, so practical advice that we can give our patients, decrease the amount of products used. So something very straightforward that I do is I sometimes keep a little sample of a moisturizer in my pocket and I'll show patients what a pea size amount of a retinoid looks like. And if I don't have that little moisturizer in my pocket, I will draw it on their paper because they get a little sheet of homework that we're going to talk about that shows them how much a pea size amount is. So sometimes I'll say a pea size amount, you know, for the full face and really emphasize how small a pea size amount is. Obviously, on our instruction sheets, we reduce the frequency of application if they're feeling dry, and we explain to patients to do that so that they don't get frustrated if they get dry. Avoiding applying particularly a retinoid directly after washing, because the earlier studies showed that applying a retinoid uh, immediately after washing could increase irritation, and of course, applying a non-comedogenic moisturizer. So when we look at studies looking at well-tolerated, easy-to-use skincare routines, it's important to simplify the treatment, ensure safety, and optimize this our adherence. And that the last bullet on this slide is very interesting to me because it talks about the use of these non-comedogenic cleansers and moisturizers that have been successful to reduce skin irritation. So we very clearly have seen this throughout tonight's discussion that gentle skincare reduces irritation and improves compliance. But the interesting thing on this slide is that studies have not been done in the pediatric population. And I think that that's an area that we could do more research because we spend a lot of time talking about skincare for our pediatric atopic patients, but we may not talk about skincare as much for our pediatric acne patients. When we think of an adult female patient who comes in with acne, we spend a lot of time talking about cleansers and moisturizers and her sunscreen. But our pediatric patient, oftentimes, I think many of us might just say here, use a salicylic acid wash or you know, a benzoyl peroxide wash, and we don't talk about moisturizers. We might not take the time to talk about dryness and irritation. And so I think this is an area where we could really improve our clinical practice and talk, spend a little more time with our pediatric patients with acne and talking about skincare and moisturizers with sunscreen and, and gentle cleansers especially our young teenagers. The older teenagers, they really love skincare because of TikTok and social media, but young teenagers may not be as familiar with a really good skincare routine. So we know that skincare is really a necessary part of an acne routine. And the last bullet on this paper, you know, our consensus paper really talks about skincare and how important it is for acne. But the last bullet talks about individualizing your skincare for each patient. So keep in mind, if you have an adult female, she might want a slightly richer moisturizer because her skin might tend to be more dry, or she might want a gentle cleanser that's creamy and non-foaming. Whereas your teenage patient or your younger 20-year-old really might like a foaming cleanser. Now, the great news is years ago, you know, foaming cleansers generally would mean a harsh cleanser. But now there's lots of foaming cleansers on the market that are not harsh. They are actually quite gentle. They don't have like the rich, like sudsy foam, but more of a gentle foam. But for people who want a gentle foaming cleanser, there are very appropriate gentle cleansers that are compatible with acne prone skin that won't strip the barrier. So I think that's very important when you're talking about skincare, choose the right skincare for the right patient. What's good for a, a moisturizer for a 45 year old woman with acne might be very different than the moisturizer you might use in a 16 year old with acne. So definitely it's not a one size fits all type situation. So the pitfalls leading to acne failures, a reluctant patient is a big one. And the most, most likely patient who's reluctant are teenagers whose parents bring them in for their acne, but the teenager really doesn't care about their acne. So I always say, as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't work if you don't use it. And if the teenager doesn't wanna treat the acne, you're really fighting an uphill battle. So make sure that the patient is aligned with what the parents want. A non-informative quick visit. So I do spend a lot of time with my acne patients, especially that first visit. I think it's really important to explain 
all of the things that we just went over with retinoids and moisturizers and sunscreen to prevent post-inflammatory pigment, all of those are important in that first visit. Giving too many treatments without a handout treatment schedule. I learned this from Dr. Schachner. He always gave a handout. And in my practice, I always give a handout. And it has those three or four steps in the morning and the three or four steps at night. And patients will take that home and tape it to their bathroom mirror. And that's their homework. And that really does improve compliance. Too strong a treatment at onset. So I really do try to start slow and increase, especially when it comes to retinoids. So, you know, maybe use every other night and increase as tolerated. Irritation without information is a big one. If you don't explain to patients what to do if they have irritation, they're just gonna stop using their prescription. So spend a lot of time on that education component of your acne patient. And don't give the illusion of a quick fix. I know we don't do that, but our patients love a quick fix and media kind of makes people think that acne gets better in two or three days and it doesn't. It really takes weeks or more. So emphasize that to the patient. Even when I was treating my teenage daughter with acne, I was surprised at how long it took to get completely clear. So one of the um, things that you can do is stress the potential downsides of treatment. So talk about irritation, stress that minimum of six to 12 weeks before improvement. And I say six weeks, you'll start to get better. 12 to 16 weeks is when you're really clear. So it takes three to four months to completely clear if someone has moderate acne. And we need to set that expectation. Place the treatment schedule handout in the patient's hands. This I also learned from Dr. Schaffner. So when they get their homework, they I hand it to the patient, they're holding it in their hands. And then I go through each of the steps, one, two, and three in the morning, and one, two, and three at night while they're holding it in their hands. So they're reading it with me together. And do not have the patient return to clinic for at least six to 12 weeks because it does take some time for those treatments to get better. So, you know, a two to three month follow up is fine. So, in conclusion, we know you've heard, and there's lots and lots of data to show us that gentle cleansers and moisturizers can improve the xerosis and the irritation that we see with acne. And really, we need to look for pH-balanced cleansers and moisturizers that also contain ceramides to promote a healthy skin barrier function. And really, when you're treating your patients with acne, skincare is really a value adjunct. I think that skincare is as important as our prescription therapies because I can predict how well patients will do if they're not using the right skincare or if they're using the right skincare. So I think we cannot underestimate the power of skincare when it comes to our acne patients. And I hope you learned a little bit more about the data that supports that in this evening's talk. Thank you so much. So again, please submit your questions using the question chat pane on the right hand side of your screen. If you think of any additional questions after the webinar is over, you can always send it to info at rbcconsultants.com. Again, we'd like to thank our supporter survey for making this educational event possible. And remember to join us for our next webinar that is gonna be on November 14th with Dr. Schachner again, and also Dr. Peter Leo on the attenuation of atopic dermatitis in newborns. So we'll pass on to uh, some questions now. The first question from our audience is, are you concerned about retinoids in skin of color? Can that cause irritation and pigmentary changes? So that's a question I get all the time and I'm not. I, if you educate the patient about starting slow, first of all, the first thing I do is ask the patient, try to assess if they have dry skin, if they have oily skin, if they have dry skin, I might start with a milder retinoid like adapalene or certain formulations that have been shown, some of the newer um, branded formulations have been shown to be more gentle and less likely to cause irritation. If they have oily skin, they might be able to tolerate some of the stronger retinoids like tazeratine. But in all of my patients who get started on a retinoid, a pea-sized amount, start every other day. If you're dry, you can decrease it even to two or three times a week. If you can tolerate it, then increase it to every single day and really use a moisturizer on top. As I mentioned, after my poll question, I always do a moisturizer on top of the retinoid. That's just by habit, but the studies show it doesn't matter. Okay, uh, another question. Are there difference in the topical acne therapies you use pre-puberty as opposed to after puberty? So that's really a great question. Uh, one of the things we have to uh, immediately acknowledge is that standard of care is not equivalent to FDA approval. Because as Dr. Willary Lloyd pointed out, 
so many of the things we use haven't been studied, especially uh, with, for FDA approval in acne, but a perfectly safe and effective and standard of care for prepubertal acne. I think the pearl is you can use the same agents, but you want to go on the low side in terms of concentration. You have options on what strength benzoyl peroxide to use, or what strength even over the counter salicylic acid preps to use uh, for your prepubertal patients. So go low and go slow. The first day, you, or the first couple of days, you may want to apply a benzoyl peroxide maybe for 15 minutes, wash it off copious cold water. Next few days, 30 minutes. Next few days, an hour. Once you can get up to an hour and you're not getting redness or peeling, especially in association with good skin care, moisturization and cleanser, you're good to go and you can leave it on. But start low and go slow. Great, thank you. Um, what type of sunscreen do you recommend for acne patients, mineral or chemical? So I, um, most acne patients like a matte finish and most mineral sunscreens have a matte finish. So I end up um, recommending in general minerals, although most of the mineral sunscreens will have octanoxate or sometimes they're a little bit mixed. So they're both mineral and have a little bit of chemical in there. But in general, I'm going to go with a mineral based sunscreen because in general, those give a matte finish and acne patients are oily and oily prone. They have oily prone skin and chemical sunscreens, not all, but in general tend to be a little bit more greasy. That's because the UVA blockers and chemical sunscreens are oils. So the only way you can have a chemical sunscreen that's not oily or a little bit more moisturizing is by adding things to the sunscreen to kind of absorb the oil in the sunscreen. So I, We'll say one thing, even though I generally recommend minerals because of that matte finish, I always say the best sunscreen is the sunscreen you want to put on every day. So if I have an acne patient who loves their chemical sunscreen, I have absolutely no problems with them using that. But if, if, or if someone comes in for the very first visit, I'm much more likely to recommend a mineral-based sunscreen for my acne patients. Okay, um, when is acne worrisome in the pediatric population? So, you know, uh, it, it's underappreciated, but newborns, 20% will have some degree of acne lesions. And acne can be seen during the first weeks and months in the first year of life. And that is not particularly worrisome uh, unless there's virilization, signs of precocious puberty, very rapid growth. And of course, you have to consider appropriate referral for workup. But the witching time is age one to about age seven. If you see acne emerge in a pediatric patient during the ages one to seven, that's more worrisome in terms of adrenal, genital, pituitary, tumor, or abnormality. If you're seeing acne emerge from one to seven, it's a mandated referral for pediatric endocrinologists. And finally, uh, are there any new therapies? So I can talk a little bit about some of the new things that um, are being studied. So actually, what just last week, actually just a few days ago, not even last week, um, a new triple prescription therapy was approved that includes a retinoid, a topical antibiotic, and um, a retinoid topical and benzoyl peroxide. So all three together. So we've had in a combinations of benzyl peroxide with a retinoid, and we've had combinations of an antibiotic with a retinoid, but we haven't had a triple combination. So that's really, really exciting because the results from those trials are, are you know, very compelling. It's basically best case scenario for people who treat a lot of acne. Um, and then that type of product, skincare is going to become really, really important because, you know, although the formulation I'm sure is great and is very well tolerated, you know, when you're using three agents at once, again, skincare is just as important as a prescription therapy. So that's something new um, that I think is coming out. And the other thing that's somewhat new um, that's being studied is, as I mentioned, the use of retinoids to treat not only the acne, but the acne scars, atrophic acne scars. So there, there's lots to come, I think, for acne. It's the number one thing we treat. So it's an exciting time. I'd add to what Dr. Willoughby Lloyd said is that when you're dealing with adolescent population, 
if you can give them things they only have to use once a day, you have a much better shot at compliance. And some of the new, the fourth generation tetracycline, saracycline is a once a day antibiotic. Uh, some of the combo uh, agents that we use are a once a day topical application. If you can do, if you can give them scripts for once a day, uh, you're going to get better adherence. I agree. Okay. And not even in adolescents, I think in all ages. <laughs> I think simple is almost always better. Well, that's all the time we have this evening. Thank you again to Dr. Heather Woolery Lloyd and Dr. Lauren Schachner for a really clinically practical and relevant presentation that will help uh, acne patients everywhere. And thank you all for joining us this evening. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.